we are going to discuss about perianal conditions from now on. So this includes hemorrhoids, uh, fistula in ano, fissure in ano, and perianal abscesses. These are very common, common pathologies. We do see them in our daily to day practice, and most people are affected by these pathologies. So, understanding these things are very, very crucial. So, I was mentioning, you know, I have a YouTube channel and I do uh, talk about these issues for the general public. And uh, most of the questions or comments I get from the public, from the general public, is about hemorrhoids <laughs> or anal fissure perianal abscess, mainly hemorrhoids. So it's a very common problem. So you guys should really understand this, these problems, okay? So hemorrhoids are nothing but like, you know, these are dilated vessels, right? So venules, veins, they get dilated around the perianal region, around the lower part of the rectum, and also in the anal canal and in the area around the anal canal. So these dilatations result in hemorrhoids. But there is a big misconception in the general public. People think it's something else. Not many people know that this is like, you know, vascular problem or pathology, okay? And that leads for uh, many of our people to be abused by, you know, traditional healers because they're because of this misconception. So when you know better, you can prevent, you can be an advocate and you can prevent, you know, patients from undergoing unnecessary unnecessary interventions uh, or treatments and all that with traditional healers. So this is external hemorrhoid. So this is simple anatomy. You have got the, uh, the rectum, you have got this dented line, below the dented, above the dented line is the rectum, below the dented line is the anal canal. Anal canal is about three to four centimeter in lingus. This is the anal orifice. So if there is a dilated, you know, tortuous vein or vein or whatever, uh, around the anal orifice, then that's external hemorrhoid. You can appreciate it. You can see it entered externally during inspection. Patients do feel it whenever they try to clean their uh, parts and all that. So that is an external hemorrhoid. So internal hemorrhoids have happen most of the time in the lower part of the rectum above the dented line. Sometimes it may calm down and they may they may be felt outside of the anal orifice. So we'll talk about that one later. So, but like, you know, some people might appreciate the skin tags. They'll tell you when I am trying to wash my uh, body, body, I feel something hanging. So that's a pile or like, you know, a tag or a skin tag. So underneath is a dilated vein or vein distending the skin. It's nothing, you know, so uh, that, that's, that's it. We call it a pile. If the skin tag, we call it a pile. That's a sign of external hemorrhoid. So when you are examining, so the anal orifice looks like a clock, right? So it's a circle like this. So we try to talk about in terms of the position, we talk about it, is it at three o'clock, it's uh, nine o'clock, six o'clock, this kind of description, okay? Uh, so th those are the common sites where you may, you may anticipate hernia I mean, uh, hemorrhoids to happen. <laughs> So internal hemorrhoid, like I said, there are vessels which may be dilated over the distal part of the rectum, maybe upper part of the anal canal. So the, the vessels which are like dilated tortures just in the anal canal or around the perianal region, we call them external hemorrhoids. So internal hemorrhoids, you can on, only, you cannot see them on physical exam. The only way you can diagnose internal hemorrhoid is by doing some scope. You know, it could be an anoscope, it could be a proctoscope or it could be a sigmoidoscope or colonoscopy. During these procedures, you will appreciate the presence of internal hemorrhoids. So external hemorrhoids are just located down, they are located externally, internal hemorrhoids, they may reach, they may be seen even outside of the uh, anal orifice. We call them prolapsing internal hemorrhoids. Otherwise, you will see them dilated, being dilated tortures when you do any scope procedure, anoscope, proctoscope, or colonoscope or sigmoidoscopy. Okay, so the perianal vessels, these are the perianal vessels which may become dilated in tortures resulting in external hemorrhoid. Okay, so this is external sphincter mechanism, this is internal sphincter mechanism, and all that. So this anatomy will revise later when we come back. Okay, so this is the anoderm. The anoderm is highly supplied with nervous, so that's why you know hemorrhoids could be external hemorrhoids could be very painful sometimes when they get extra. I mean, thrombosed. 
you know we'll talk about complications later on so internal hemorrhoids different pictures internal hemorrhoids i feel like this external hemorrhoids so this is a dentate line above it is rectum, and below it is the anal canal so you can see you know sometimes dilated tortuous veins can be visible during inspection especially like you know you know those untreated uh, untreated internal hemorrhoids which are pro prolapsing when you see them they are prolapsed they are not going back again we will talk about staging in a minute and then like you know if it is completely prolapsed it's not going back again then you may see something like this you know something protruding and you can see that this is a vascular structure because you can see that somehow it's dark. It's, you can tell that this is a venous structure, which is dilated process and prolapsed. I think this is the time during the time of surgery they're trying to take off this, this dilated tortuous segments. Okay, so here is a hemorrhoid or piles. There is a Goliger uh, grading. So stage one is simple. Remember like this. No protrusion of hemorrhoids yet, but there is like, you know, bleeding. So the only common presenting complaint is rectal bleeding. So differential diagnosis for rectal bleeding, somebody comes with, you know, I see blood in the bus tap, or I do see blood in the soft paper, or I do see, um, you know, some blood mixed with my stool. So then that's a worrisome complaint. So always try to exclude malignancy until proved otherwise, especially in the elderly, right? So it could be colon cancer, it could be anal cancer, it could be rectal cancer, which is presenting with blood. So that's an alarming sign, okay, or symptom presenting complaints. So if a patient comes with rectal bleeding, differentials include a hemorrhoids, it could be, like I say, rectal cancer, anal cancer, colon cancer, it could be any polyps you know colon polyps rectal polyps you know it could be diverticular bleeding diverticular diverticulitis or it could be anal fissure so you should be able to differentiate between these these pathologies you know only bleeding so uh, all these are possibilities so th there are key questions to ask in each category so simple painless bright red bleeding could be hemorrhoid so it cannot be it cannot be fissure because I say painless bleeding, because like fissures, they come with a very painful experience, okay, during defecation or after defecation, all right? So if there is pain associated with the bleeding, it's something else, okay? Painless bleeding through the rectum could be due to hemorrhoids, and uh, that could be it, only painless bleeding. Stage two, pro there is some protrusion. Hemorrhoids can protrude and they reduce by themselves spontaneously. They get protruded, they reduce but when you are done, you know, straining and the defecation process is over, then they go back by themselves, spontaneous reduction. Stage three is they do protrude and they need some hand manipulation or manual manipulation for them to be reduced. So that is a stage three. They come out, you just manipulate them with your fingers, manual manipulation, and they get reduced. And the fourth stage is they protrude and they stay outside permanently. You cannot manually reduce them. So stage three and stage four are the ones who are indication, which are indications for any intervention. So stage one and stage two, you know, symptomatic management, dietary modification, I'll talk about them in a minute. So there are different, you know, conservative management and there is no indication for surgery for stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four requires surgical intervention. Those who are protruding require manual reduction, they are stage three. Those who are permanently uh, protruding and they cannot be reduced with manual manipulation, they are Okay, so external hemorrhoids, these are under the skin around the anus. Most of the presenting complaint is itching or irritation during anal region, pain or discomfort, swelling around the anus and bleeding. These are the presenting complaints. So these, these venules, these venous structures around the anus, they do take part in terms of, you know, maintaining our capacity to remain co continent, you know? So they do play some parts. So sometimes, you know, when there is this dilatation and everything, people may, might have some degree of incontinence to fecal matter. So something might be leaking 
and then that brings about you know skin irritation around the anal region so just irritation itching and all that can be the presenting complaint they may bleed they may be very painful when they get thrombosed. So one of the common complications of external hemorrhoid is thrombosis. So external hemorrhoid thrombosis, that means a clot forming within that dilated vein around the perianal region, is a very, very painful experience. Very painful experience. They come crying to you because the anoderm, like I told you, is being distended. It's highly vascular, I mean, highly innervated. So there are many pain, vib pain fibers around that region. So it's a very painful experience. So the treatment is just simply evacuation. You just apply local anesthesia around that thrombosed hemorrhoid, just make an incision, try to evacuate the clot. That's it. Patient would thank you, jump on you, maybe hug you in happiness because you relieve them with pain. So the pain threshold lasts for about 72 hours. So they have to, whatever intervention interventions you do, you should do it within the first 72 hours because after 72 hours, of course, the pain threshold would be up and then like, you know, it just vanishes. So any intervention you do for thrombosed external hemorrhoid should be within the first 72 hours because that's a very painful timing. All right, so that's that's about it. Internal hemorrhoids, you know, they are inside the rectum. Usually they can you cannot see them. I talked about it. Uh, they may present, they rarely cause discomfort there inside. So painless bleeding during bowel movement is a commonest presenting complaint. Sometimes they may be prolapsed or they may protrude, like I said, and that re results in pain as well as irritation. As you have seen in that previous slide, when they are like protruding like this, you can see the anal kind of become patchless and then the continence will be aff affected. There will be some leak from the rectum so that area gets irritated, it may become infected and all that. I remember a patient who came, I used to work at the Holbushek clinic and then like, you know, this guy came from Debrazade and he was in pain and he was walking like this. You know, he can't even walk. He can't sit, he can't walk. He came with a stage four, completely prolapsed internal hemorrhoid. I'll never forget that person. Then I had to operate him on emergency, okay? It's completely outside. It's a very painful experience. The area was irritated and all that. He cannot sit. He cannot, he, he cannot assume any position. It was a very painful experience. So that happens when it is prolapsed uh, and stage four. Thrombus hemorrhoids, severe pain, swelling, inflammation, a hard laminal runners. So in area where there was a pile and it becomes harder because it's thrombosed. So that's a painful experience. I told you about it. So causes, there are different causes. So straining during bowel movement, sitting for long periods of time in a toilet, having chronic diarrhea or constipation, obesity, pregnancy, uh, anal intercourse, uh, eating low fiber diet, regular heavy lifting. These are common predisposing factors for hemorrhoids, okay? And most importantly, you know, I would stress on uh, chronic constipation as well as staying long periods on the toilet. There is one one saying, so lavatory is not a library, okay? It's not a library. If you go to very fancy hotels, the bathrooms or the toilets are very fancy. They put newsletters, uh, magazines and everything. Have you, have you seen such fancy toilets? So people would be sitting there and start reading and they would be straining and straining for minutes and minutes. And that what happens is whenever we are straining, there is what is known as you are applying this uh, sphincter mechanism will apply, would act as a sphincter and compresses against those veins. So the venous return is going to be compromised. Those, those veins would be dilated and distended. And then it predisposes you to hemorrhoid formation. So stay in the toilet as long as it is necessary don't over strain if there is something if you feel something just you know evacuate then if there is nothing leave the room okay that's a basic principle and most people especially those with constipation they would be sitting in a toilet for hours and hours minutes and minutes and they will be continuously straining that strangulates those veins and then it makes them dilated and tortious and eventually develop hernia i mean uh, hemorrhoids prevention eat high fiber foods drink plenty of fluids uh, consider fiber supplements don't strain too much go as soon as you feel the urge so the other thing is all these steps are in an attempt to prevent constipation because like you know when you have the urge to go to the bathroom 
when we get busy, you are a medical student, quality is up, uh, approaching, you don't want to go to the bathroom, you don't want to be distracted. So you postpone the urge. So what happens is your colon starts reabsorbing the fluid contents from your, your uh, feces. So the fecal matter becomes hard and hard. So what happens when it becomes hard, you are constipated. When you are constipated, you have to strain for a longer hours. That increases your risk of developing hemorrhoids. That's why we say go as soon as you feel the urge. Exercise helps avoid long periods of the sitting. Try to move around because like when you are sitting, the venous uh, fluid, I mean, the venous blood would, uh, would, would settle there. There would be stasis and the veins may become distended, okay? Uh, diagnosis, digital rectal examination, so you can do an inspection. If it is external hemorrhoid, you can see them. If it is a protruded a stage four external hemorrhoid, internal hemorrhoid, you can also see something coming through the anal orifice. Uh, the other thing is you can do anoscope, proctoscope, or colonoscope, especially to diagnose internal hemorrhoids. Treatment, homemade remedies. Eight high fiber foods use topical uh, treatments. Uh, commonest one we used to use in our dish was uh, anusol suppository. It has some steroids, I think, and it has some local anesthetic lidocaine or something like that. So you can use either the suppository or you can use the cream so that, you know, settles the inflammation if there is any pain and all that, that numbs the area. Uh, soak regularly in a warm bath or seat bath. I'll show you what a seat bath is in another slide. So it's something which you can fit into your bath tub. Then you apply water, then you add some salt, then you just sit there for about 10, 15 minutes, a little bit warmer, 10 to 15 minutes. That helps a lot and uh, take oral pain relievers if you have like you know, very painful thrombosed hemorrhoids. Uh, you can also use some systemic analgesics like you know, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medicines, paracetamol and all that. So external hemorrhoid, external hemorrhoid thrombectomy, if it becomes this complication, thrombosis, you have to evacuate the thrombus. Uh, minimal invasive uh, procedures like rubber band ligation, injection, sclerotherapy, coagulation using laser bipolar can also be applied. So surgical procedures, mainly hemorrhoidectomy, hemorrhoid stapling are the ones which we use. Okay, so these are the things we use. Uh, so nowadays, especially in the West, they just do rubber band ligation or you know injection sclerotherapy or in some centers. They do use laser or bipolar energy to thrombose them. But you know, the typical surgery we do in Ethiopia is hemorrhoidectomy. I used to do that when I was in general surgery, even like you know, after finishing chest surgery as well. I used to do them in uh, in private hospitals. So we do use we do hemorrhoidectomy, resection of those dilated tortuous prolapsing veins, especially for stage three and stage four internal hemorrhoids. Typically you do hemorrhoidectomies. Or if they are like simple manageable with rubber band ligation, you can also apply rubber band ligation. But it is very painful, by the way, especially for external hemorrhoid. Like I said, since the another has many uh, pain fibers, you know, so it's not it's an, easy, an easy procedure. It looks like you know, it just it seems simple because you are applying a rubber band. You leave it there until it slaps. It's a very painful experience to the patient. So. This is all about hemorrhoids. Is there anything missing on hemorrhoids? So differential diagnosis, remember colon cancer, rectal cancer, uh, diverticular bleeding, diverticular bleeding polyps, okay? Anal fissures, these are the differential diagnosis for any rectal bleeding, including hemorrhoids. So if somebody asks you differential, those are the ones, all right? So just for the interest of time, I wouldn't waste too much time on this one. So I will go to the next presentation and the next uh, pre-anal, uh, peri condition. So Bruke, you can pause the recording until I bring that. Thank you so much guys again. So uh, we are going to continue our discussion on about uh, anal fissures. They also call them fissure in ano. These are also very fa famous, I mean, very common conditions, perianal conditions, there are differential diagnosis for rectal bleeding. So anybody who comes with bleeding during bowel movement, one of the differential diagnosis is anal fissure. So you can see a fissure here, typical. So, so this is most probably chronic fissure. It's not healing, it, it has been there <coughs> for a longer time. So fissure in ano, 
acute anal fissure, you can see the fissure here. Most of the time, acute fissures, there will be bleeding chronic fissures. There will be chronic granulation tissue in the base. They may not be actively bleeding. They may not be as such ble uh, painful as well, but acute anal fissures are very painful. Most of the time, they will have bright red bleeding, okay? So you can see this is the anal orifice. The ulcer, the ulcer is also extending externally as well. A very painful experience, very, very painful experience. And the common presentation is pain during defecation, after defecation, and also bright red bleeding during defecation. Okay, pain sometimes very severe during bowel movement. So to the extent people will be, you know, scared of going to the bathroom, they will avoid going to the bathroom. Believe me, very painful experience. So they will just abandon going to the bathroom. Pain after bowel movements that can last up to several hours. So you have a bowel movement now and you may have the pain for about two, three hours even after defecation. That's why they are scared of going to the bathroom. So that is a vicious cycle. Reason being like, you know, when we are avoiding going to the bathroom, what happens to the to the to the fecal matter is like like I told you, the bowel would start reabsorbing any fluid within it. So it becomes hard, it becomes, uh, you know, uh, dry and hard. So one reason when you are trying to pass that one, since you are constipated, it takes longer time for you to defecate that content, number one. And number two, when you are defecating that hard stool, it causes crack in the anal mucosa. So that's the reason why you have the anal fissure to begin with passing hard and big stool and to make it worse it's like you know tearing further and further so that's a vicious cycle people would be in a difficult situation and brighter red blood in a stool or toilet paper after bowel movement visible cracking the skin around the anus and a small lump or skin attack can also be sometimes seen in in, in association with uh, anal fissure especially if it is a chronic a chronic fissure, most of the time, there will be just at the end externally, there will be a skin tag associated with it, okay? You may not see that. You see how painful it is, this you know, picture depicts how the experience is really, really a painful experience, okay? Especially following bowel movement. So they will never go to the bathroom. They will avoid going to the bathroom at any cost. So you can see bright red bleeding. So bright red bleeding differential diagnosis, we already talked about it when we talk about hemorrhoids, hemorrhoids, anal fissure, uh, diverticular, colon cancer, anal cancer, okay? Any bleeding from the lower part of the GIT can be a differential diagnosis for bright red bleeding, but it is not a major bleeding. It's not a massive bleeding. It's some small bleeding, but it is bright red, okay? So anal fissure, you can see the fissure here and you can see the skin tag, you see, there is a skin tag, there is a fissure here, there is a skin tag, which is hanging externally outside of the anal canal. So passing large or hard uh, stools is a common cause, constipation and straining during bowel movement, chronic diarrhea, anal intercourse, childbirth, uh, also are common cause of anal fissure, okay? Uh, less common causes like patients with Crohn's disease, patients with tuberculosis, anal cancer, HIV, tuberculosis, syphilis. These are also some rare causes of anal feature. So risk factors, constipation, childbirth, Crohn's disease, again, like, you know, whatever we said are causes, are risk factors, anal intercourse, age. Age is also very important. Anal features are very, they can occur at any age, but more common in infants and during uh, middle-aged adults between 20 and 40 years old people are more affected with anal fissures than any other okay that's very important so kids infants can also suffer from anal fissure because you know sometimes when you start feeding them with uh, with milk they tend to become constipated they strain a lot to pass that hard hardened stool they're constipated they strain a lot they cry a lot and then they crack their anal, anal canal, okay? And resulting in, in anal fissure. So complications, it may fail to heal. So anal fissure that fails to heal within eight weeks is considered chronic, okay? So it might need further surgical treatment. It may come back again. It heals that extends to the surrounding sphincter muscle can also, you know, may compromise your continence, okay? Making it more difficult for your anal fissure to heal because if it involves the muscle, then the healing process takes a longer time and gets compromised. So history is very important. Typical history, painful, 
defecation, pain after the, during defecation, after defecation, they describe it as if they are sensing there is a tearing going on, okay? Very painful experience. Physical exam, like I said, if you do anoscope, digital rectal examination is going to be very painful. They are not going to let you put your fingers within the anal canal, very painful experience. It's very painful. The ulcer is painful because the anoder might hold you. It's highly uh, innervated with pain fibers. Anoscope can be done flexible, uh, sigmoidoscopy, colonoscopy can also diagnose anal features. So this is a simple anoscope just for you. So sigmoidoscopy, if you have never seen this, I like, you know, just for demonstration, this is how it is done. Flexible uh, sigmoidoscopy is like this, you do it. So it, there is a, it has a camera colonoscopy. So anal fissure treatment. So this is how you do it. This is what is meant by a seat bath. So in the bathtub, you put some plastic container where you are putting some water. Then you try to sit there. You bath yourself, you sit. Your butt sits in it. So you st stay there for about 10, 15 minutes. So that cleans the area, facilitates healing warmer uh, water so increases vascularity more blood flow and all that so one of the challenges of anal fissure the blood supply around the perianal region is poor then you know sometimes you know the healing gets compromised there is no good enough blood supply going into that crack so that's why it's not healing fast okay adequate water intake fiber intake it was <laughs> just like hemorrhoids you avoid constipation you avoid exacerbation of the anal fissure Alternative, sometimes you can apply nitroglycerin cream. Nitroglycerin, as you know, it's a small muscle relaxant. So it increases blood flow and promotes healing. So it just dilates the arterial supply. So good blood supply would be there towards the cracks then the healing gets facilitated. One side effect is headache, local anesthetic agents like lidocaine, anus, ano, what did anusol suppository or anusol cream can be applied because it contains lidocaine, lidocaine, it's, which is a local anesthetic, it numbs the area, so it's, it becomes less, less painful. Botulinum toxin can be applied because the main reason why people might tend to develop anal fissure is because of the tightness of their anal sphincter. So the, the sphincter mechanism is so tight, that the healing gets compromised, healing gets delayed, so sometimes we may inject botulinum toxin. So sometimes if these measures fail, you can also use some blood pressure medications, especially calcium channel blockers. So you can use nifedipine or diltiazem, which are both you know, calcium channel blockers. Surgical options, you know, if all these measures fail, you know, if all these measures fail and uh, whatever you have applied, lifestyle modification, dietary modification, everything fails, then you can, the last resort would be lateral sphincterotomy. To be honest with you, yes, I mean, this morning somebody on my TikTok was asking me, I have recurrent, I mean, uh, anal fissure, what shall I do and, uh, and what is the complication with the surgery? I just responded this morning to this question. It's a very common co uh, problem, okay? So lateral sphincterotomy can be done. I have done this procedure only once at where was that hospital? Uh, do you know uh, Cadisco Hospital? That guy, uh, his insurance was only covering at Cadisco. So I did the surgery in Cadisco Hospital many years ago. So lateral sphincterotomy. That was a young gentleman who was really suffering from this. So it may cause incontinence. So you have to be really careful because you are cutting the sphincter muscle. So uh, you may end up converting this patient from one, having uh, one problem. You may give him another another problem in a form of incontinence. So you should know the anatomy and you should know what you are doing when you are doing this procedure, okay? So dietary and lifestyle modification, like I say, increase fiber intake, adequate water intake, don't strain much. The same advice we give to those people with hemorrhoids, okay? So this is Fisher in Ano, very simple, straightforward, in short, at least in summary. Okay, so you can pause it now again, and then, you know, my last presentation would be on. Welcome back again. So this is going to be a discussion about perianal abscesses, and perianal abscesses are one of the very common perianal conditions uh, we deal with. It's very common. We see it quite often in emergency department. So, you know, everyone needs to understand these conditions. So perianal abscesses are abscesses which are happening around the anal orifice. So the classification 
could be you know complex we will try to uh, uh, you know simplify it as much as possible so when patients present we have to ask key questions so parents you have to take adequate amount of you know good history and you should do appropriate physical examination which includes digital rectal examination and um, oh uh, that is a no i'm so sorry Okay, so perianal abscesses, I'm sorry, I'm going back. So uh, causes of perianal abscesses is approximately 10% of perirectal abscesses are taught not to be due to infected anal glands, but the majority are related to infected perianal glands. So when the glands, perianal glands get infected, the ducts are obliterated, then that creates a safe haven for bacteria to proliferate. Then the, when the duct gets obstructed, bacteria proliferates, there will be stasis and there will be bacterial proliferation, then that means there is an infection going on, then the glands become infected, then that eventually becomes a perianal abscess. So that's the mechanism. So duct closure, obstruction, stasis, bacterial proliferation, infection of the ducts, and then perianal abscess, that's a pathophysiology. About 10% may not be related to, you know, uh, infection of the perianal glands. So there are consequences of more specific causes like Crohn's disease, trauma, HIV, long-term steroid treatment, sexually transmitted diseases, anal sex, radiation therapy, TB, diabetes, which is uncontrolled. These are common risk factors. So whenever you see a patient with peri perirectal abscess or perianal abscess, these are risk factors, these are potential causes. So you have to find out when you take history, you know, you are not only talking about the swelling around the anus and all that, but you know, you have to go in a greater depth and ask, you know, try to find out what is the predisposing factor, okay? So the classifications, there are different types. So there are abscesses which can happen between the external sphincter and the internal anal sphincter. We call them intersphincteric abscesses, uh, the ischiorectal abscesses in the ischiorectal area. And we can have around the anal canal perirectal abscesses and you can have abscesses above the levator anai muscle, supra, we call them supra levator abscesses. So there are different types. So it's complex, you know, it's not an easy subject, the surgery and everything. The anatomy is complex, as you know. So this, this is another picture, supra levator abscess, intersphincteric abscess between internal and external sphincter, ischiorectal abscess, okay, between the rectum and the ischium and perianal abscesses, which is found around the anus. So clinical presentation, very painful, perianal swelling. Perianal swelling, very painful. Patient cannot defecate. Patient has very painful experience when they are sitting. And during physical examination, you can see redness. You can see glistening because there is acute inflammation going on. So you can see the skin is like, you know, shiny. It's, uh, it's red and shiny, okay? So, uh, okay, that's something else that's for Fistola, I'm sorry. So, let me go back. So, this presentation is about perianal abscesses and Fistula in Ano. And reason being, reason being, I should have seen that, I should have said that at the beginning, reason being, uh, perianal abscesses and fistulas are like, you know, spectrum of a same disease entity. So it all starts with uh, perianal infection, abscesses, and then eventually when you treat it with treatment or without treatment, patient might develop fistula in ano or perianal fistulas. So it's a spectrum. So you have perianal abscess and there is, at the other end, you may have fistula in ano. So don't be confused. So this is an abscess. It may burst by itself if it is not treated. It may burst and patients may come with a painful discharging swelling, or you may, patients may come like this and you do the incision here and drain the abscess and it, you know, healing goes on, but some patients might complicate with fistula formation, okay? So fistula is an abnormal communication between two epithelialized surfaces, as you know. So it has two openings. So internal opening, there will be a, an external opening down there externally. So the internal opening, you know, as you see, is just above the dentate line. It's communicating with the rectum. So 
That's why people, fistula patients, they may not have a swelling, but they may come with itching sensation around the anal canal, around the perianal region. There will be irritation because there is uh, anything, you know, fecal matter, pus, anything could dribble through this, you know, fistula tract. It contaminates the area. It wets the underwear. The perianal region is like, you know, irritated inflamed there will be dermatitis so that may be the reason why they may come to you discharge they notice discharge there may not be a painful experience but when you ask some in a retrospect if you ask them did you have you ever had any swelling around the anus they may tell you yeah there was a swelling there was, which was very painful it just burst by itself i didn't seek medical advice and now i have this problem or they may tell you yes i had that painful tender swelling i went to the doctor they drained it now i am having this problem you know what i mean so that's why i'm telling you it's a spectrum of uh, certain it's just, uh, the same disease okay the same disease process so this beautifully demonstrates the fistula tract internal opening external opening this is what is meant by an abnormal communication between two epithelialized surfaces this is covered by epithelium, skin is covered by epithelium. So fistula is um, normal communication between two epithelialized surfaces, okay? So these are the anorectal fistulas. So there is a classification just like the abscesses. There are different types of, you know, fistulas. So the fistula can be, the tract could be running through the submucosa. We call it submucosal fistula. If the fistula tract is running between the internal an external sphincter mechanism like this, we call it intersphincteric fistula. If the tract is traversing through the external sphincter mechanism, we call it transsphincteric fistula. It runs through the sphincter mechanism. Or if it goes up and comes like this, suprasphincteric and extrasphincteric means it's not at all related with the sphincter mechanism. So we call it extrasphincteric fistula. If it is going up, into the supra, supra levator muscle, levator ani muscle, and traverses the external sphincter mechanism. We call it uh, suprasphincteric. It goes above the sphincter mechanism. Okay. So yeah, extrasphincteric. Like I said, it's not as such connected or related with the sphincter mechanism. So that's a deep fusti fistula strike, and the management is going to be very challenging. Some fistulas are traversing through both internal and external sphincter mechanism. That's why we call them trans-sphincteric fistulas. Between the internal sphincter and external sphincter, we call it inter, between the two inter means between the two. Supra-sphincteric, it goes above the sphincter mechanism, we call it supra-sphincteric, okay? So this is a physical examination finding. You can see there is some something nodularity, some nodularity. This guy has multiple fistula for sure. And some of them are obliterated already. So that's why we always advise patients to come to us whenever they have an active discharge, because you know you cannot see the external opening. If there is an active discharge, you can identify the external opening, so diagnosis becomes easy, okay? So because, you know, this has healed temporarily, you don't see any, any, any you know, opening externally, but most probably, believe me, this person might have had any, you know, perianal abscess that has drained or healed. That's why you see all this scarring and all that, okay? So you can see some hemorrhoids, right? So this is the anal orifice, you know, this is a vessel. You can see that dilated veins, you know, it's a vascular structure, it's easily identifiable. There are some, some hemorrhoids going on, but it looks like there is also some healed scar around here, most probably that may be the external opening of the fistula tract. So history physical examination is more important. Transrectal ultrasound, CT, MRI can also be used to diagnose, you know, perianal abscesses. These are fancy things, whereas we never use the MRI or CT. But if you have the access, if you want to delineate the pattern of the fistula tract and all that, and to plan your surgery accordingly, you can also do, you know, pelvic MRI, pelvic CT, or transrectal ultrasound may help you. But there are some base, uh, bedside ways of identifying the fistula tract. So I will show you. So the ultrasound can diagnose abscess. So this is, I mean, the investigation, I'm talking about both abscesses and fistula. So you can diagnose fistula 
by using an ultrasound, you can see the abscess cavity, right? This is transrectal ultrasound. You can see this abscess cavity. MRI CT can also easily diagnose, you know, uh, perirectal abscesses or perianal abscesses as well. And it can tell you the extent of the abscess. And the same is true with the fistula strap. So the treatment for perianal abscesses, you can give oral antibiotics, IV antibiotics, depending on how bad is the infection, incision and drainage is the absolute treatment and post-surgical care, painkiller, wound care, seat baths, stool softener, and all that can be applied, okay? So incision in, and drainage means, you know, you identify the area where there is abscess, you make an incision, you can see the kidney dish. So this is one of the purposes of a kidney dish. You can see the surgeon is using the kidney dish to collect this abscess, and you can see a frank has been drained and this retractor is going into the uh, anal orifice, okay? So seat bath, this is a seat bath, you know, so you are putting it in a bath tub, you fill it with water, you just soak your, uh, your perineum in this bath for about 10 to 15 minutes. That facilitates sealing and it also helps to clean the area. Diagnosis, perianal fistula, or for fistula in anal physical exam, ultrasound, CT MRI, Anoscope, proctoscope, colonoscope, you can also be used to identify the internal opening. Hydrogen peroxide, the way we use hydrogen peroxide is once you identify the external opening, you bring hydrogen peroxide with a searing, inject it through the external sphincter, and you try to, you try, you try to see through anoscope or anoscope, uh, anoscope or proctoscope, and you try to identify the internal opening because Hydrogen peroxide bubbles, right? When it touches through that, it passes through the tissue. So you try to identify where exactly that uh, hydrogen peroxide is coming, or you can also inject some uh, methylene blue or other dyes can also be injected. And you can see where exactly the dye is coming. And that way you try to identify the internal opening. Why do we need it? Because we need to identify both the external and the internal openings so that we connect between the two. You know, we do fistulotomy eventually. So this is how we inject hydrogen peroxide or any other that you see. They have identified the external opening. This is the anal orifice, the external opening is here. So they are injecting this uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide or any dye through the external opening and they look inside. So the surgeon looks inside, you know, through this speculum and try to identify the internal opening, okay? All right. So then uh, treatment fistula in ano. Uh, one thing you should know, this is anot there is anatomic classification, anterior fistula, posterior fistula. Most of the time, if the external opening is anterior to the anal orifice, so there is, you draw an arbitrary transverse anal line. So this is the anal orifice, transverse line, you know, in, in, in the middle, then whatever uh, opening behind it is posterior whatever in front of it is anterior. So if the external opening is anterior, most of the time the fistula tract is simple and straight, okay? If the external opening is located posteriorly, most of the time the fistula tract is complicated. It's not like, you know, simple straightforward. So you have to really plan your treatment plan. You know, you have to prepare yourself because the tract is not simple. It's complicated most of the time. So if the fistula has this kind of shape, we call it a horseshoe. So options of treatment, fistulotomy, I'll describe what fistulotomy is, satan placement. Satan means, you know, you apply a silk stitch, you apply a stitch or something. Most of the time we used to use a silk stitch. So you pass this silk stitch between the internal and external opening and it comes outside and then you tie it. And then what happens is it's an office procedure. The patient goes home. After a week, the patient comes, you release it, more tight, you tighten the, the stitch. And then after a week, a week, another week, you tighten it more. After another week, you tighten it more. So in this process, it cuts through the stitch, cuts through the tissue, and eventually it opens up the fistula tract. So you lay it open. So we call it a set cutting set and placement. Advancement flap, if it fails to heal, you may do a flap procedure and try to obliterate that fistula tract. Uh, you may also do staged procedure. A staged procedure is mainly for those complicated uh, fistula tracts, especially those which are located in the posterior. Like I show you, if it is a very complicated fistula tract, it takes a long time to heal. 
So sometimes you might be forced to do a diversion colostomy. You do the fistula repair, and then eventually you may reverse the fistula after the, I mean, the colostomy after the fistula heals. So you see here, so uh, there is a speculum, anal speculum here. This is the anal canal. And you see this metal, this metal is coming through the internal opening. And you see the metal here, right? So this is the external opening. So what happens is the surgeon probes through the external opening here and tries to go, pushes the metal through. And then you identify the internal opening and the metal comes out. So what you do is, this is very simple, straightforward. So you just cut here. So starting from here, you cut, 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 cut. Then the metal comes out. So that means you lay the fistula tract open like this, like open, like a book. So the fistula tract is open like this. That's what's meant by fistulotomy. So this is what happens. You see, so the internal opening is here. The metal tip is here. The other metal tip is here. So you cut and connect these two openings. Then what happens is finally the metal comes out because you have already opened up the tract. So the tract is this one, and then you use uh, curate to curate the uh, base so that you facilitate healing. If there is a dead tissue, infection and everything, you curate it, wash it and everything, you lay it open. Then that way it uh, heals with granulation tissue through time and the fistula tract will be obliterated. Uh, some people might apply stitch at the age of this uh, fistula tract. We call it marsupialization. That's not always necessary, but some surgeons might do that. <laughs> so when you marsupialize it, that means that tissue cannot come to each other and uh, close uh, prematurely before, like you know, there is granulation tissue build up to obliterate the tract. So this is what happens. So this is the external opening. This is where the internal, we have seen the internal opening, you lay it open. This is what is meant by fistulotomy. So the tract was here. Now you have opened it up. So you create this area, you create this space, you create this space, you create this space, improve, I mean, remove any deep tissue, granulation tissue. That way you facilitate healing. So, you know, this is a raw area. It takes weeks, maybe months to heal. But that's the definitive treatment. Otherwise, the patient will have like, you know, closure, the discharge disappears, it comes back again, it disappears, it comes back again. It's very, very troublesome to the patient. So this is what is meant by a state placement. You can see the stitch which is applied. It passes through the internal opening and the external opening, you tie it. So when you tie, means it cuts through the tissue. Patient goes home, you tighten it after a week, you tighten it after a week, you tighten it after a week. Eventually, it cuts through the tissue, just similar to the uh, to, to, similar to the fistulotomy. So the reason why we use Satan is especially if you suspect that the sphincter mechanism is involved, like transsphincteric, intersphincteric kind of uh, fistulas. If you cut <laughs> day one, that means you make the person in, the person incontinent because you are cutting through the sphincter muscle. So the patient becomes incontinent. We are trying to avoid incontinence by doing certain placements. So the certain cuts gradually, healing happens. You cut gradually, you cut gradually. You are not cutting the sphincter just day one. You know what I mean? All at the same time, it cuts through the tissue gradually. So certain can be applied, especially for complex fistulas. Yeah, cutting Satan and then, yeah, some people in the waist, I have never had this experience, but in literatures, some people might apply fibrin glue, so they try to fill that fistula tract. So you see the internal opening here because you see the tip of this, this instrument here, right? So that is the internal opening. This is the external opening. So they apply a fibrin glue within this fistula tract so that in an effect, in a, in an effect to obliterate that's fistula tract, okay? So that can also be applied. I don't think this is available in our center and I don't have any experience, but I have seen it in literatures. So this is it. I mean, you know, I, I kind of rushed, but you know, I want to finish everything today so that we avoid any other, any other inconvenience to you. Guys, do you have any question? You have any questions? Uh, yes. Okay, go ahead, please. Um, so with fistulotomy, mm -hmm. um, 
uh, what is the mechanism by which you keep the depleted areas? Um, uh, so, since it is an area whereby you know the person might need to defecate, how do you keep that mm -hmm. area sterile, or do you just leave it? No, I mean you know the, that area has never been uh, sterile anyway, because like you know within the, that fistula tract already some fecal matter escapes into that canal, right? So I mean it's contaminated already. So just to decrease the infection rate or any other complications related to infection, one of the things which should help you is like, you know, the seat pads, you know, you maintain the hygiene as much as possible. Patient would be, you know, sitting on a seat pads maybe three times a day. So that, that way, you know, you clean the area. You can also wash that area with soap and water and everything. So you try to keep it as clean as possible. Yeah, there is nothing you can do about it. It's already a contaminated area. It has been contaminated. It's going to be contaminated a little bit, but like, you know, as when you defecate, you have to use, you know, the seat pads and that kind of cleans area facilitates healing, yeah. So if there is no this fancy seat pads, um, I don't think it's, I have never seen it in Ethiopia. So if that happens, you can advise people to have an, any plastic container. That's how you can advise them if they cannot have these seat bases available. And you can also, you know, continuously wash the area. It's a nice question. Any other question, guys? Comment? Comments? Questions? Nothing? Everything is clear? Huh? Uh, I guess so. Okay, good. So, you know, we'll continue having this kind of discussion.